compassion, awareness, and wisdom. Dream Yoga and Lucid Dreaming Dream Yoga is one of the six yogas of Naropa collected in India and brought to Tibet 1,000 years ago by Marpa the Translator. Dream Yoga is the study of how to take a thread of awareness with you as you are going into sleep and how to keep that awareness with you while you are asleep. Dream Yoga is a powerful tool to help clear hindrances from the depths of the psyche and help heal your inner being. Lucid dreaming is to know that you are dreaming, to wake up in a dream and stay in the dream while being aware of it. At more advanced levels, lucid dreamers are able to consciously make choices and decisions within a dream. Lucid dreaming as a phenomena was known and cultivated in ancient Greece and India at least 2,000 years ago. Lucid dreaming as a modern study started with psychoanalytical dream analysis in the early 20th century. The modern science of lucid dreaming has evolved in science labs over the last 40 years and now uses sophisticated monitoring technology. But the original ancient forms of dream yoga and lucid dreaming are still valid today for individuals as cognitive tools for inner healing and personal transformative growth. The power of the two disciplines can be greatly enhanced when used together interactively. This is an incredibly valuable area to be involved in. The uh, ability to be able to wake up in your dream and have it be knowing, knowing that you're dreaming while you're dreaming. Okay. It's also uh, has been part of an ancient tradition in the uh, Buddhist tantric uh, tradition from the teachings of the uh, six yogas of Naropa. Okay. The six yogas of Naropa are the, the deepest level of tantric Buddhist teaching that are available to us and probably the most important teachings that have ever been available to human beings on this planet here. And they are those practices that are like Tumohit, uh, Kundalini Yoga, mastering of the chemistry of the body. The practice of uh, illusory body yoga, which starts with the deity practices we've, we've been doing. The uh, dream yoga, light ro- yoga, bardo yoga, and transference yoga. Traditionally, the dream yoga in that tradition of the tantric was based upon mastery of the two mohit first. So that teaching is, is interesting. The, the work called dream yoga has been handed down, but it actually is, is fairly not accessible, really. And the instructions for it have, have been a bit uh, vague. They're, they're there, but... It's a lot of intermediate type of priming that, that has been lost or is not available. Okay? And then we have the, uh, the Western tradition of uh, being awake in dreams, which is quite old, actually. Uh, you know, five, six hundred years old at least. It even goes back into the Greek tradition that they talk about that. But recently, there's, there's uh, at, uh, out of Stanford, uh, Stephen LaBerge. Stephen LaBerge is, uh, is the kind of the focal point for this new, this new uh, gathering of uh, information about lucid dreaming. And if you are at all interested in this, you should definitely buy his book called Lucid Dreaming. It's becoming much, much more refined than dream yoga. And basically they're using the same techniques. They're using the same things, except they're very, very much more sensible than the the tantric yoga traditions. Then you should definitely get the book Lucid Dreaming by LeBurge. Okay. But what we're going to do tonight is be a little bit more specific And we're going to really talk about what we call the shadow side, the nightmares, and how to work with those to actually heal the splits in your being. Okay. So, 
So there are three things that we need to uh, to consider when you do the, any type of these spiritual uh, contemplative practices. Is that you 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 really uh, need to have some will to succeed in them. You want to do them. You have to actually want to do this practice here. The second thing you need, the same thing as for when you would do meditation, is you have to have very a very clear a very clear understanding of the techniques involved to bring about this lucid dreaming. There are very clear exercises that you will need to be familiar with to be successful with the lucid dreaming in a much more inclusive and broader spiritual unfolding way. Not just to have a lucid dream, but to be able to consistently work with dreams for your spiritual growth and transformation. So you need to be familiar. You have to want to do it. You have to have to know the technique. And you actually have to believe that you actually can succeed in this, in this, in this work here. Okay, the first step. I've had so many people, every time I mention this, I have people come up to me afterward and they say, well, I don't dream. I don't dream. How many people in here don't dream? Cool. Wow, that sounds a lot of problems right there. <laughs> I don't remember mine. <laughs> yeah, that's the second half. <laughs> How do you know you dream if you don't remember them? You have a vague idea. Well, you remember that you had a dream, but you don't remember what the content was yeah. like that. Okay, so that's, that's, these are the first obstacles that need to be, be overcome in, in doing this work. This is my favorite area of exploration. It is so incredible, so incredible that we have basically, we'll, we'll be generous and say one-third of your life is spent basically barely conscious. The first stage in here is actually getting dream recall. And what you should know is that dreams uh, from, and this is part of the beginnings of the advantages in our day and age of having science behind our spiritual traditions. Incredibly important. They're able to actually determine what time is the best time to do dream work. So everyone, every dreaming is done in, uh, it, it, your dream cycles, your, your sleeping, your sleeping cycles are divided into pretty much precisely 90 minute sections where you go for 90 minutes and you wake up for a little while and you go back to sleep again. Whether you remember you woke up or not, you have 90 minute cycles. Starting from the very first cycle, you have dreams, but they're not usually very accessible and they're very short, five minutes, 10 minutes long. This is from measuring it in a, in a laboratory over decades of consistent work with thousands of practitioners. So it, it, it basically, the, you need to get to the fourth cycle at the six hours sleep. You need to let the body do its repair work. And that isn't a good time to practice dream recall. It is possible, but it's not the easiest, and it's better to wait until after that six-hour point. And they start to get uh, clearer and longer. After eight hours, uh, between like six and eight is a good time uh, to add to most people. That's the time that they have available to them. But uh, So your dreams are going to be like 20 minutes long, 30 minutes long. That's six to eight, eight slots. After eight hours, they go to be uh, in the 90-minute cycle. They're 40 to 50-minute long dream sequences and much more accessible, much easier to, uh, to, to remember if you train yourself, if you will yourself to remember your dreams. So the first step in lucid dreaming is actually being able just to remember your dreams to start with. And of course, have some way of stimulating the dreams so that you can remember to remember your dreams. Uh, 
there are various ways, ancient and modern, that help you uh, uh, have more clarity in your dreams. In the older traditions, we visualized uh, colored discs, work with color or illumination, and it brightens the mind. And it does have a tendency to be the dreams to be a bit more vivid and clear. But the modern way of doing it, same as the older way of remembering dreams, is to actually begin to <coughs> you have to suggest to yourself, you have to uh, say to yourself, I want to remember uh, no, I don't want to, I will remember my dreams tonight. A will, it's like a, a willpower to uh, remember your dreams. It doesn't have to be uh, all that forceful. But you do have to start uh, seeding yourself that you are going to remember your, you're going to remember your dreams. It is, that is quite important to do that. The second thing that you should have handy to do this work is something to record your dreams on. Okay. Now, let's assume that we're going to be as easy on ourselves as we can, and we know that we're not even going to bother re trying to record uh, dreams until after six hours. That cycle there where you're having dream, and it's ream, it's ream, ream means rapid eye movements, because the eyes are actually moving, and your whole body is actually muscles are working on. Everything that you're doing in the dream is is shadowed in your actual body. If you're running away from a monster, your legs are, your nervous system is activating a little bit. You've seen dogs do it, well you do it too. Okay. Eighty percent of all children's dreams are chase scenes and maybe not that far off for adults. We all know that, right? I seem to be motivated by fear, hope, and expectations. Dreams. Fear, hope, and expectations. So we know that we're going to have better dreams after six hours, and after eight hours are going to get longer and more clear and easier to recognize. So we could set up an alarm clock or just when we wake up. If you're like me, you'll wake up anyway. You'll wake up frequently. And uh, at that point, you write down your dream. And when you start, you, you don't start big. You just say, I'm going to extract one dream memory tonight. You should all commit yourself, no, just one dream memory tonight. Just one. It can be a single memory of a building, a person, a sound, and just write it down very simply. To start with, it can be longer if you have the capacity to remember it, but just begin by disciplining yourself just to get one fragment of any dream, and it is beginning, the beginning of a long discipline of recording dreams. Okay. So now we have a way of jotting down dreams. So you dream. You have at least one dream per cycle, usually up to five if they're shorter in the seven and a half hour range. They start to, uh, uh, if they, they can be up to 50 minutes long, but if they are shorter you will have more of them. Okay. So after you get one dream down you start to try and remember two. Okay. When you get good at doing that, the next step that we do that's, that's critical, the next step that's critical for lucid dreaming is called dream signs. Dream signs, okay? Strong dream signs and weak dream signs. They're signs that you're dreaming. If you see an elephant flying through the sky, that is a strong dream sign. Okay. If you are visiting a friend 
and you're having a conversation with them that you that should be actually living in New Zealand, that's a weak dream sign. But it's highly unlikely because you haven't heard anything that he's coming, right? So we begin to gather a list of strong and weak dream signs out of our notebook. We actually extract them out and begin to make a list of strong and weak dream signs. And the point of this is, is that when you're dreaming, of course, it's, it seems real, right? It's, it's normal. But if you can actually begin to work with these dream signs when you're awake, and look at them and study them and consciously suggest that if you actually see this in a dream, you're going to recognize that you're in a dream. Okay, that's, that's like working toward the uh, capacity to wake up in a dream and recognize that you're in a dream. Okay. Now there are different levels of clarity and different experiences that can happen in, in dreams. And uh, uh, not all lucid dreams are equal. Some of them are less are lucid, but less lucid than others. There is a type of, uh, what we're talking, working toward, we'll say, full lucidity in the dream, where you may be just commentent, com, a commentary on what is happening in the dream as it's happening. Okay. There's also another... Uh, uh, type of dream, uh, in, it's not REAM dream, and it's not body repair dream. I guess we could put it under a subcategory of REAM dream, where you actually uh, are working out problems in a dream. Okay. Now the most famous example of this that I know of is the uh, There's, there's a table called the, I think it's called the periodic element table. Mendelem. Mendelem. Some way of putting all the uh, table together in ways that made sense. And he'd been working on this for, and his colleagues, and many, many other people for a very, very, very long time. Mm -hmm. He was thinking about this, how to organize these elements. How, how do you actually make sense of it? And, and he, was take, he took this to sleep, and actually the answer came to him in the dream. Mm -hmm. The whole thing, complete. Yep. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he woke up, he got to the table, and he just wrote down exactly what was in the dream. And he said he only had to make one minor correction. Wow. Wow. That really, really opens up the potential of that type of specialized dream. But now we're getting dream signs. So we, we, we now are used to writing our dreams down. We want to get more uh, precise with them. And there's some uh, ways of, uh, that you should be familiar with that are great assets to remembering dreams. You know, the idea of stimulating the dreams is, is an important asset uh, practice to develop. One of those ways that is uh, used to stimulate dreams is you actually, uh, like right now, you, you listen. Okay, I can hear the fan. These light bulbs are buzzing. There's a ruffling shovel in, in the room. Just be aware of all the senses that you have, all the subtleties in hearing. And you look around at the, uh, everything in the room. A very clear visual of everything in the room. Color, shape, distance, textures, smells. And you get really, really familiar with that, and then you, 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 you recall a dream that you can remember, and try and uh, feel the difference between the dream and this present reality here. 
and, and really question whether you are in a dream right now or not. You have to question whether you are in a dream right now or not. And then you should actually try and make this uh, into a dream. Like, make this scene here, you're um, imagining now, you're using your imagination to make this feel like a dream. What do you remember about a dream? What, what, what is the difference between this waking reality and the sleep reality? That's like a, a, a contrasting situation. And then you actually visualize one of your dream signs. And with that type of priming, you carry that uh, idea of recognizing a dream sign when you're going to sleep. And you repeat it like a mantra almost over and over again, just to start with. And that will help you be more... We probably won't get a lucid dream at this time, but it will really help to begin to create clearer and stronger dreams that you can record down. Now, after you've woken up, you don't move. You definitely don't move the body at all. You stay right where you are. And you get right on the dream recall right away. That's part of what you're training yourself to do before you go to bed. I'm going to remember your dream. If you're going to remember your dream, when you wake up, you don't start thinking about the day's activity. You don't think about emails. You don't be wandering, get pushed off in any other directions. You stay right on it, and you get into your dream. You don't move your body at all. You want to stay in exactly the same position that you were in when you woke up. There's a lot of uh, chemicals in the body that settle in certain ways that give dreams tones and you don't want to disturb that. You want to stay very still. And then you review in your mind and you question it like, what, what was I just dreaming? What, what was it? You know, what, did it? Was it color? Was it, what was the feel? What was it? If you don't remember, you, you, you question until you, can, you start to extract it and it might not be at the end, it might be in the middle or the beginning, but from there you try and build it up while you're lying down. Before you write anything down, you build it up while you're lying down. And then, when you got it fairly clear in your mind, you get right up and write it down right away. And if you don't, it'll probably disappear. But most likely, will be forgotten. So you need to be fairly uh, disciplined in, in, in doing that. Uh, work like that. Say at the uh, at the seven and a half hour point, if you were to to wake wake up and actually go like say what I do, let's go and do the dishes downstairs. The lights are on. Maybe even work on my exercise. Uh, I've recorded my dream. I've recorded it, now I'm, I'm getting up and I'm taking a break, and you stay up for 30 minutes to one hour, and then go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. You have 51 more, 51 more times as much potential of recognizing clearly your next dream, or waking up in your dream and having a lucid dream, by taking a break at that point when you've had enough body rest, and you are getting into the longer dream cycles. Very interesting. So we got our dream signs, we've got our, our stuff we've written down, we know that we can't move in the morning when we wake up and have a dream, or in the middle of the night, it's not the morning yet. Now we're actually uh, uh, ready to start working more uh, consciously with the actual waking up in a dream, lucid dreaming. There are actually two ways of, uh, of, of doing that. Uh, one of them is that you wake up in the dream. The second way is that you enter the dream awake. And the Tibetan system, or the Talopa, or the Naropa system from India, which was imported into Tibet, the dream yoga was that you actually went into the dream awake. So this form of lucid dreaming as generally taught in the West 
they do both ways. But the idea of waking up in the dream is the one that has the most emphasis in the West. Although that is beginning to change as they're getting better at entering into dreams awake. It's supposed to be much, much easier to wake up in a dream than it is to enter a dream awake. Yes? Yeah. I don't understand the difference. The difference between those te two techniques. Okay. Yeah. I don't know. I'm not sure what you're saying. I wake can't. up in a dream? Wake up in a dream. Yes. Mm -hmm. so that I'm asleep and then I wake up inside the dream but I'm not physically awake. But That's exactly. You're abs yes. And the other one is? That when you are lying down to enter sleep, there are ways that you can use to enter sleep awake. Okay? And the ancient ways that were practiced were taught a person how to enter a dream without losing consciousness. In other words, the body went to sleep, but the mind stayed awake. And in the lucid dreaming as taught in the West, the mind goes to sleep and the body goes to sleep, but you're training yourself to recognize unusual things happening that jolt you, that are a trigger, that you wake up in the dream. And it is amazing what happens when you wake up in the dream. It is absolutely thrilling. One of the things that's predominant happens is everything gets really solid, spacious senses, all the senses are active. There's still problems with things disappearing when you walk away, but you can have actually uh, a, a, a in, in the more kind of skill level of it, you can actually determine what you're going to do in the dream. You can determine what you're going to do. In other words, for example, if you are practicing a heart radiance practice of metta and you are going to prime yourself as an activity to do in the lucid dreaming, if you've recognized a, uh, a dream sign, there's one thing of waking up in the dream, the next level is what am I going to do when I wake up in the dream right now? What really fascinates me is what we call the shadow, the nightmare, the shadow. <coughs> dreams are really, well, what are dreams really? <laughs> what, what, what is it? And in the community of dream practitioners and in the, 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 specul the speculation of what dreams are for, and uh, there's, some of them get pretty crazy. Uh, there's no real uh, solid agreement upon people that are in this area of study, like full-time. But there are some things that they are, they are not. They, they are not as, uh, uh, the, exactly the same as the, as the waking state. The, the waking state's stability that we we call stability is because there are actual physical objects that aren't disappearing all the time that we can look at and look away and look back again and, and they're still there. And that is also part of the work of, of making a difference in recognizing dreams. In a dream, in a dream, everything that happens in the dream is mind generated. It's not generated from looking at objects that are solid in the outside world. Basically, they're mind-generated. And people are totally hypnotized by them. But I find, I find that the mind-generated emotion that comes up in dreams is telling me something. And there's a lot of fear in those dreams. Everybody's got to be honest about it. And there are chase scenes. Why? What, what's the message there? And how do you work with that? 
I tried, my first thing was, my first experiment uh, about 35 years ago, which I was very successful with, was is to turn into one of these wrathful Haruka deities and smash out my enemies and crush them out of existence. That was very satisfying. <laughs> Ripping my father's head off. That was pretty cool. But they pop back to life again. It doesn't resolve the, uh, the inner conflict. So that, that is not the way to go. I also tried being chased and then sit down in meditation and do metta. That's wonderful. I just dissolved everything in pink light and was able to sit in this wonderful radiance. It was just beautiful. I woke up just, wow. That didn't resolve the issue. We need to be uh, actually quite active in the, the dream. And this is the part of the lucid dreaming I think is incredibly valuable, is that you do have an enemy and you're being chased and you wake up you you I would say that that fear in being chased by a robot is a dream sign and that if that happens and you primed yourself that that is a dream sign and you've made a pre-decision that actually I am not going to run I'm actually going to ask him what the what he's what he wants, what you know, what is he doing? You know, can I help you, or are you supposed to teach me something? Like, start up a uh, start up a dialogue. It can't be aggressive and it can't be totally passive. It has to be intelligent and sensible, because you're talking to yourself. If you understand this is all your own mind generating a story that's incredibly important for you to pay attention to because it's starving your energies in real life. These things have to be looked at or you're never going to be totally free, for sure. There's something. They're saying something. And the ability to have work in dreams like this is incredibly exciting, actually. And if you make friends with one of those enemy figures, they change. They change from being enemies to actually being allies. And when that occurs, the exhilaration you feel on waking up is, is really good because you know that something has changed in the depth of your being. A way that I found that uh, worked for the, uh, the enemies in the dream is I actually started to put a plate beside my bed with some cookies on it and a glass of milk. Uh, and made it very clear that this was for that demon in my dream. So it helped me, like visually I had to prepare it, I had to think about it. It was an actual real object and it was uh, a priming me to, to, to make friends with the enemy in the dream. Okay, we've gotten our dream, our dream journal down, we're keeping track of our dreams, we uh, are now know the dream signs. We're priming ourselves in the daytime to figure out what's the difference between a dream and what's the difference between solid reality. We're imagining what this would be like in a dream, like the walls moving or maybe things changing. Another technique that they discovered that works really well to determine whether you're in a dream or not is to actually have a text with you in the waking state or a clock. Just look at your clock. Okay. Or a piece of paper with some, a sentence on it and look away, and look back in the day, look at the sentence again, look away, look back. If nothing changes, it's a pretty good chance you're not in a dream. <clears throat> and then you imagine actually trying to change that sentence, to see if you can actually change it like it would in a dream. What happens in a dream is that things don't stay stable. So the sentence or the clock, something changes. If you read the sentence once and you look away and you go back again, it's gone, or part of it's gone. So it's, again, it's another type of a, a, a training yourself in the waking state to use techniques in the dream that you can tell whether you're dreaming or whether you're awake when you do it while you're awake.
and you actually imagine again what it would be like and you use imagery that you remember from the dreams to prime yourself in imagination exercises while you're awake. How many people have had lucid dreams here, by the way? Okay, all right. So you know, like, before you've had a lucid dream, it's, it's kind of hard to believe that a dream could change that much, that you could be aware in it. What I have found is when I have a lucid dream, I actually have to keep saying, Whoa, this is a dream. This is a dream. Mm -hmm. This is a dream. And some technique to remind you, you kind of fall off. And you, you fall back into a semi-lucid dream. It's usually very, very vivid yet, but, but you, you need, there are techniques to help uh, get you back on track again. Can you imagine how this is going to be in a hundred years with all people beginning to work in this field over and over again, yes? Um, I found if you try to take too much control over the dream, you wake up. Is there a way to avoid that? You, usually, usually you get pretty excited when you have a lucid dream and you do wake up mm. when you're first beginning it. That, that it that's, that's, that's part of the, the getting used to it that, a, that you have to do over and over again. What do you mean by too much control? Change the, the buildings totally or just, yeah, just walk like in a stairs? Influence everything as influence. opposed to just being aware. I think just keep, keep doing them over and over again see what happens. Yeah. But part of the waking up and the technique that they use if you're, if you're going off course with it is they actually spin themselves in a circle. Just spin. Just start spinning around. And for some reason that actually stabilizes it again. And you don't wake up and you don't fall off. I haven't been able to do that one yet, but uh, if you really start to become familiar with the, with the lucid dreaming, and you know that there is this period after six hours, we'll say seven and a half hours, when you wake up from a dream, when you actually wake up from a dream, but it hasn't been a lucid dream, and it's in that six, seven, eight hour thing, and you wake up, you recall, before writing down anything, you don't write anything down, you just do a recall. And at that point, what you do, suggest to yourself while you're doing the recall, you look at that dream, you, you, I mean, you look at the dream, and you remember it, and there will be a dream sign there somewhere, because all dreams have weird things happening. So when you recognize that, you work with that particular sign that you've just had in the dream. You recall it. You keep it close in mind. You say, I'm going to go back into the dream. I'm going to go back to sleep. And you kind of hold this idea that I'm going to remember, I'm going to recognize that dream sign or one of my other dream signs. And you hold that thought while you're going back to sleep and you review the dream over and over again. If you start thinking about emails and that, you go back to the recycling through, remembering the dream that you've just had, remembering a dream sign that you've just had in the dream, suggesting yourself if there are any other dream signs that you recognize, you're going to wake up in that dream and have a lucid dream. And you recycle through that whole thing, just gently laying there, just go through the dream, refresh it over and over again, until you drop to sleep on that thought, not on emails, on that thought. And that will quite often do it. That will most likely bring you into a lucid dream. Now, because this is in its infancy, you will, uh, you could very easily discover uh, techniques that haven't even been introduced yet. There are electronic devices that have been developed. It's a set of goggles that have actually read, the, uh, read whether the eyes are moving and then when they are, it's just these blinking lights there that actually penetrate through like something from the outside world into the dream world so that you can wake up in a dream and have, the, have a, a, a recall and be able to write it, write it down. Or you can wake up in the dream, it will prime you prime you, you prime yourself with this electronic device to say that this is a lucid dream. Okay. I didn't go that way at all. That's cheating. <laughs> <laughs>
but quite seriously, anything that works is, is okay. Other people use an alarm clock, and after the six-hour thing, they might set it for 45 minutes, which would be right in the center of a REM cycle, and then that will go off, and it will bring you to alertness, and you will have a better chance of remembering the dreams instead of just sort of falling back unconscious again or going to sleep. Another way, my technique, I invented this. <laughs> drink, get up and drink two or three glasses of water. And you'll get up about every 20 or 30 minutes. <laughs> it, 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 it actually really works because not only do you wake up, but you actually have to get up and go down to the toilet. Yes? There's two things, that, uh -huh. uh, two, two aspects in being a woman that makes this easy. One is when you're nursing a baby. Yes. I had lots of dream stuff when I was oh. nursing babies. And the other is menopause. Yeah, great. I, um, when I was in university, Mm -hmm. I took a course called Sleep and Dreams, <laughs> and we would use we used a sleep lab, and we would put electrodes on each other's skulls, and we'd yeah. go to sleep. Mm -hmm. And some of the electrodes recorded well; they were recording the the brainwave activity, yeah. but they were also picking up REM. Mm -hmm. And so, as soon as you're out, so you you'd be somebody would be sleeping, and the other ones up would be monitoring. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we saw REM spikes happening, mm -hmm. we'd wait a minute and then wake them up. Would it be, would it be a story that would maybe have taken place over a half an hour or an hour? But it happened in 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. But the, we would cut off the REM after one minute. Oh, I see. Wake them up in the, you wake them up in the REM. Oh, wake them up right just one so, minute into it. Without, so, give them 60 seconds of REM and then ask what so, they were dreaming about. I often really wonder, wondered about that. Yeah. I actually mm -hmm. wondered about that same question yeah. my, myself. Yeah. Could you um, make explicit when we have dreams or lucid dreaming to remember or how will it benefit all sentient beings? What is the purpose? of going into dreams? All right, the, the, the simple answer is the blind can't lead the blind. All these techniques, these different techniques that I have been teaching here and that you've learned from other teachers, Brian, Jerry, and Shannon, and everyone else that comes through, we're all giving you little bits and pieces that you can use for the dumb going of your suffering. <coughs> Lucid dreaming, I think, I feel, for my, myself, it's one of the most powerful tools that you can use in the city as being a city yoga. You're doing it while you're sleeping. The time is wasted. And as far as prophetic dreams go, uh, in, uh, that, the, uh, that is uh, generally not something that happens to a person that's really damaged and needs to have some work done in the depth of their being. What's prophetic dreams and teaching dreams are generally a later phase in a person's journey to growth and transformation. Generally speaking, a young person's dreams are chase scenes, but they're very murky. And there are lots of dark things there. There isn't much uh, uh, light in the dreams. As a being grows a bit older, if there's been any growth and transformation in them, they get to be a little bit more solid, just a little bit, but there's actually a bit more color in them. And the generally figures in the dream are scary, but not quite so horrific as they were when a person is really young. And as you get more mature on the spiritual path, the dreams get more ordinary, just ordinary situations. Travel, hotel rooms, meeting, things like that. And as you get very clear, or you get lucid dreamings, or you're very more awakened to being, then you have start to have teaching dreams. And if you are conscious in your dreams, like in the Tibetan yoga, one of the main reasons they use it, two reasons. One is that they go inside of people's bodies and diagnose illnesses and get remedies, healing. Another one is, is that they, they, they have dialogues with uh, avatars yeah. and get teachings. And all these are for your own downgoing of suffering. Your downgoing of suffering 
subtracts so many pieces of suffering from the total suffering on the planet. And if you are in a really good space, and if you are a bright being, whoever you come in contact with begins to get a little more hope. And there is a radiance, a transference of that. I don't think one individual is going to actually radiate out and heal the whole planet completely. That's a bit unrealistic. But it's not unrealistic that you heal yourself. And it's certainly not, and it's totally correct in thinking that you're going to be more effective in influencing and healing the people in your vicinity. Yeah, Brenda? I'm curious about why younger people have more scary dreams, or that the figures in the dreams are more, like you said, horrific, than somebody who's had more experience, has seen more terrible things in their lifetime, who's had experiences that are traumatic. I'm not saying that that can't happen to a young person, but you think that there would be more of an innocence or a clean Mm -hmm. more of a clean slate, like mm -hmm. where are these things coming from? I can't answer that question. I know from my own like review that it is uh, it is that way. They get, get better, they get clearer, sharper. Scary, still scary, yes? Well, could it just be that when you're a little kid, you, you're having nightmares and you call out and your mom and dad come? Yes. And then when you get older and you learn to deal with scary situations, you not even call it to your own dad. But we're also just taking note of the dreams they're having when they've woken up. When they're having nightmares. So yeah. some little kids have lots of happy dreams, but they just don't remember them. Because they're not waking up. Is that a possibility? It, 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 I suppose it is a possibility, but according to research, it is, it is 80% dreams are chase scenes. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is not a pleasant situation. No. There's some fear there like that. Yeah. I found that sir, my, the content of my dreams has always come from real life situations in the last 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And what I know, I work, the way I work, the way, uh, I'm going to go into this side now, because this is getting away from that and into the way that it's unfolded for me, which is a, not what I expected at all. First of all, I'm not interested in the imagery whatsoever, except for these dream signs. That's mm -hmm. very useful. What I wake up with is a feeling, there's an emotion, and it's extremely strong. It's very, very, very clear. And I'll be quite frank with you, the idea between dreaming and waking, that barrier has become very, very thin. I recognize in my day-to-day -day life all the emotions that I have in the dreams that cause really scary scenarios happening hundreds of times every day. Hundreds of times every day. Over little things. But because of the movements of the body and the solidness of the reality, they're masked and last for very short periods. For example, two days ago, I had my nice hot espresso coffee there on the counter and I went into the fridge to get the 10% cream. Mm -hmm. Just a little bit in there. And I went through this. <gasps> oh, gone. But just, just there. Everything, my whole wonderful Arahat base just. <laughs> but then back again, right away. So that, will, that type of thing, those, those strong feelings that you have in dreams, they're incredibly strong. And they last for a very, quite, seem to be a long time. And they don't change too much in the dream of the chase scene. It's scary from the beginning to the end. So for me, for me, it's the dream tone, right? I bring it out. But what was really, really unusual, and for me has been quite exciting, is that now I sit in my meditation at night, and I actually bring that feeling out. It brings me back into the dream. Okay? The feeling brings me back into the dream. And then it starts to unfold back into time. With all the other dreams 
I have ever had. I go through a thousand dream recalls in a two-hour meditation sitting, reviewing all the dreams. It's like they're all connected together in one network. It's, it's, and I'm totally alert and excited by being able to remember those dreams consciously like that and remember the feelings that came up with the dreams. It's not the intensity of the feelings I have in the dreams, but it's, it's definitely the same feeling, and I can handle it. That's how it's going so far. It's like I don't know what's going to happen next, but I'm quite excited about doing this, this work. Okay, I wanted to talk, uh, uh, as I say, I really think it's important. These are nice talks to have, it's very stimulating. But if you want a systematic and detailed uh, 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 model of how to work with lucid dreaming, read the book Lucid Dreaming by LaBerge. There's one more way. We're talking primarily so far about waking up in a dream by suggestion. There's the other way is going into the dream awake, which is the way that I was trained starting about 40, 40 years ago. And the way that we, we do that uh, is the way that is done traditionally in the dream yoga work is you make a visualization in your throat. Okay. Now, it's a, it's, it's, it's a lotus in your throat. Each one of the petals is a different color and there's a mantra on each one and you basically concentrate on the uh, petals and as you fall asleep, the petals dissolve and you go to the next one. Dreams will start, the dream starts to happen. You start to, you start to go in and out of a dream like that. So what you're doing is you're, you're keeping the mind uh, a, a thread of uh, clarity while you're allowing the body to go to sleep. And it's like the dream starts to form and you're kind of, you're, you're in the dream and the lotus is still there and you're kind of saying, whoa, am I in a dream or am I awake or am I not awake? And then you wake up a little bit and you go back. And basically, you, you then, like, as, as, as you descend farther into the dream, you might lose the lucidity, but you are actually able to go into the dream more reliably with practice and, and descend into the dream. Usually, after you're in it for a while, unless you have some uh, techniques developed, you might actually lose the lucidity that you're in a dream. But it is a way. I have actually found that very easy to do. And I actually now have gone from the, the uh, throat center to the heart center. And I do my, I do my mantra practice with Chen Ray Z as I'm going to sleep and keep, keep practicing it. That has been very effective for me. The same thing happened in my heart center, the throat, but the heart center for me was just a whole lot easier just to rest there because I live there anyway. And so it's just a natural thing to do. And I just forget about everything else and I just slowly say my mantra until I don't have to say it and it's kind of going automatically, automatically. And then the images start to come up in, in the heart chakra, just the images of a dream, a dream. And, I, and then I'm, I, I'm, I'm aware and the dream is there, but you're not, it's not the same quality as waking up while you're in a full-blown dream. It isn't fully formed yet. Mm -hmm. So you, you, there is a skill of letting it go farther in and still being awake and then choosing what to do. And in that technique there, you would try to change something. You would change a yellow to blue you would learn to m manipulate the, uh, the images uh, in a very orderly and simple way until finally you were able to travel to a Buddha realm and get teachings. Or, or go into another person's body who has, is ill and be able to diagnose where the problem is. Or actually do healing at, at, in their body by manipulating the energy field. That, that's the... To, that's a traditional form of the of the dream of the dream work. Mm -hmm. Yes, let's let's have some questions here now. Uh, Doug, do you uh, bother making any? Do you find any useful distinction between lucid dreaming and astral projection? Uh, 
Uh, yes, I do. I mean, I, I don't know if it's useful or not, but, but I make a distinction. Can you elaborate? Can you talk about that? Well, astral dream, usually, usually when they're talking astral projection, <clears throat> they have to imagine that they're actually leaving the body behind and the consciousness is traveling to another location. In actual fact, that isn't what happens at all. You actually are just traveling to another location. You're already there. You're already interconnected with everything in the universe. <laughs> oh, but they need a technique to realize, to get over the hurdle of understanding that they are connected with everything. The dream work is so easy. There's so little effort put into doing this work for such great results. <laughs> People here are at all interested in growth and transformation and the exploration of their human potential mm -hmm. in the city. I would highly recommend that you do, uh, do s begin to do this work with dream, with dream work. Yeah, Doug? Can you say more about how you work with shadow material in the dream? Uh, yes. You have to recognize, first of all, that it is your own mind, and you do need to work with the lucid dreaming. And the shadows are the monsters that are trace chasing you. Well, one of the areas that I have uh, hit a block at that I haven't actually penetrated yet as far as shadow goes is it, it has been fairly easy to recognize a shadow and the feeling that's present in a chase scene. It's always a chase scene, mm. a threatening scene. And to do something about it if there's a, there's a single object to focus on that's another being it's, it's, it, it is easier, but you can only do that if you can wake up and, and have a pre-plan that you're going to dialogue with this shadow being. And if you can do that, this seems to be a fairly instant resolution and a healing in that area, for, from my experience. They, they, they may reoccur in a different way, I don't expect it to be done in just one time, but it is actually a very effective way of working with some very, very deep fears that we have in our in our being. You know? And it will be that you might have a, a, a complete resolution of that in the dream. Mm -hmm. I think it's just as likely, or more likely, to be able to have a complete resolution in the dream than it is in the waking state. It is, it is really a hidden part of your being that only is accessible in those in those dream states. Now, the, the part that I've come up that has been difficult for me to, to grasp is, okay, you got a shadow happening with a being. Well, what happens if it's actually not a being? What happens if it's, say, uh, those like rooms that you move through where they're getting smaller, tunnels, uh, uh, like, like environments, mm -hmm. environments like a, a forest or a, a bridge that's breaking apart over a, a body of water, that there's no there's no actual like sharks or animals or beings. Mm -hmm. You may have been chased or you may not have been, but there is this environment that there's nothing to. What do you do there? What do you do in a, a, a situation like that? That that I haven't I haven't figured that out. Could you change into something that would communicate it more effectively? Yeah, and then they would immediately switch into something else, and yeah. if you still didn't get that, you ask it again. That's right. And eventually, if you yeah. switch into something, you go, yeah. ah. Yeah. I'm talking about non-figures, non things, mm -hmm. inanimate, mm -hmm. inanimate traps that are, are mm -hmm. hard to, uh, but I suppose mm -hmm. I could ask the same talk thing. To the same I could still talk the to the same thing. I'll do that. Mm -hmm. They really are talking to you, these dreams. They really are, are knocking on the door saying, look at this feeling here, look at this. Yeah. This is something that, that's in your being mm -hmm. that is in some way taking up energy to keep it out of ordinary consciousness. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes? And, and, and in the same way, do these practices help us deal with the dying process as well? A absolutely. Mm -hmm. In more ways than you would think would be possible. One of these things, as we were talking about these petals on the throat when you go to sleep, or the idea of things beginning to shrink down as you're going into sleep. There's a, there's a process of the outer shrinking to the inner, right? 
and as you become more uh, skilled in this awareness, uh, especially if you're going into a dream consciously, especially, and that is one of the advantages of going into a dream consciously, usually the flowers in the old tradition had four petals on them. Four petals. And you went through four stages that you were supposed to be able to feel the outer shrinking away and certain types of mind patternings in the body dissipating. So the first types of, we're calling winds in the body, energy patterns, all mind states, all these influences that are just bubbling in us, when they activate, they create a patterning of energy in the body. The first thing that goes away when you're going to sleep is the patterning of aggression. It goes away. The second thing that goes away is the dreams of the new Porsche. <laughs> and then, the last thing that goes away before you go to sleep is this ignorance, this dark. <clears throat> when you go into jhana practice, the same thing happens. When you go into concentration, a bliss state, in a higher level of, of contemplative practice called jhana, as you are, are doing your practice, your mantra work, and you're going into a deeper state of concentration, before you go in there, you might have fantasies, aggression, lots of greed, sex fantasies, you know, dull states. As you get more concentrated, you actually notice that the aggression things now are, are dissipating. They're not, they're, the energies in the bodies are, are smoothing out. And, but the greed is still there, it's really kind of luscious, and then that kind of goes away, and then the dullness in the mind goes away, and you go into this clear state. Same thing happens when you die. Mm -hmm. Okay, the outer world uh, shrinks away and you're going more and more on the inner world. So this work that's done more consciously going into dreams consciously or developing jhana and understand exactly what's happening in and actually the coming out, the same thing happens when you go, when you die or basically when you are re rebirthed again. So yes, there's a direct parallel, but this is extremely subtle high tantric work, right? Very, very subtle. Uh, which is why they do in the tantric tradition they 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 stress that you you do a lot of heart based work first and if the master determines whether you're actually fit to do the higher tantras they will give you instructions in the six yogas of naropa but before you go farther you have to actually be able to do tumohit kundalini yoga what it what it is doing is these patternings in your body that create mind states and are the storehouse of actual subconscious mind states, the energy body. They are basically causing a, a disturbance, a, a, an aberration in the natural flow of energies in the body. There are holes in it, there are, uh, are areas that are, that are bent and crippled, so the uh, wholesome work done first of relieving excess negativity in the being through heart-based practices or therapy is essential to do the kundalini work because it blows up anything that's in the being, gets really strong. So once you have that a capacity where you're a bit clean, a bit wholesome, moral virtue in your being, you work with the kundalini yoga, being uh, bringing the energies through the various chakra points in the body and spreading it out and there's a lot of pain involved with that as they're opening up and weird things happen, really weird things happen. But once they're clean, the energies are like a baby. They're soft all the time. And that means that these winds in the body have really been dissipated greatly. And that makes this work with the other yogas much more richer and, and fuller. And part of it is that's different in the old traditions than in the newer traditions, which I'm sure they'll catch on to within the next hundred years, is that this was actually training for the dying and going in more consciously into the dying process. Because the same thing that happens going into a dream, things shrink away, right? Things shrink away, and then there's a new reality that forms. So if you can die and a new reality forms and you've got awareness, pretty cool. <laughs> I have that. I remember that very, very clearly, which is very unusual. Okay. 
something I have done in the past caused me to have special abilities which I've inherited from whoever that was that did all that work. Mm -hmm. And now I'm starting to share it with people. Mm -hmm. Yes, in the back there. Um, and then during the daytime, I'm discovering that I'm getting a lot of the same feelings or these, these are, I say, was it in passing? And it seems to, it seems, it seems to mean something. Absolutely. I think anytime you become aware of a feeling, you are becoming much closer at getting a resolution to it than not recognizing it at all and being pushed around blindly by those feelings. <coughs> to, to me, that there, there, there has to be an awareness of what is in the whole contents of the, the being. I, I think there's a lot more hidden than there is conscious. It, you know, I'm beginning to come to that. What, what, how can you determine whether you are a perfected being or not? Or how can you, what, what are the criteria for that? One of them that's a, a very interesting one is it says that the inner and the outer are in accord. But that's good that the work you do, and that, it, it just brings up a whole different point. Is that a lot of the crap that we got handed down to us about scriptures and what attainment is and what's supposed to disappear and what's going to remain, that's a bunch of bullshit. <laughs> and it's, it's, just, it's just ridiculous. It's just totally absurd to think that a person is going to have a momentary experience of something called MAGA, a blackout, or some ridiculous thing, and they're going to be cured of everything. You, you, you might see through the basic kind of general principles of the universe some big experience is just blowing out of the suffering. It's just really simple. It's really simple. And that a lot of the scriptures that have been handed down, you realize, for, you know, even the Theravada scripture, it's Theravada, Theravada, the original Theravada. I mean, it wasn't even written down for the first 250 years, and then it disappeared completely about 100 B.C., and then it was revitalized, and they went around and tried to find all the pe people that knew anything about it, rewrote it again, and came up with this, this kind of consolidated teaching about 430 Christ era, that is really, really, you read that stuff and, and you know that that's been worked over and worked over by scholars over and over and over and over and over again. If you really want to really, really, really feel bad about yourself, read the first <laughs> section of the Wasudi Maga about morality. I mean, it really, really gets to be a bit ridiculous. Now, on the other hand, there's a wealth of incredibly valuable information in these ancient teachings. Uh, the Wutsudi Maga is a, is a very valuable document that's been handed down to us, but you really have to read that and reflect upon it and try to read deeply into what it's trying to say. You have to, it has to, it's like a detective. You have to actually, basically, before you understand that, you actually have had, had some transcendent experience understand even what they're talking about and sorting out the difference of it and say, okay, that's wrong. Okay, I'm sorry I get off on that. One. It's, just, it's, just, it's just the emotional thing. And like, like I've really, really recently read some of the Western teachers and they all, all are this, they all have this thing, they're recognizing the fact that uh, people have uh, feelings and that they need to be worked with. And the Buddhist tradition basically says, forget that. Like bypass, it's not important. We're not working on mom and dad. We're working on the general laws of the universe. And I guess that's okay if you go in the monastery at six years old and you stay there until you die. You never have to have to communicate and have a relationship and go in the public. But once you walk out the door of that monastery and you get a girlfriend, you're in really deep trouble. <laughs> There's some very painful experience. <laughs> Tolku recognizes a very young age, and he talks about uh, how he was in, uh, he was studying in uh, Amsterdam, and he met this young uh, uh, Netherlands girl, who he called a modern girl, <laughs> and uh, he said that it was amazing, he kind of supported her, they lived together, but like every, about every four or five days they would be out having coffee, and she would say, didn't that guy over there have a nice butt? And he, she would just take off and disappear for have an affair for four or five days and then come back again. He says he just tore his heart out, but he was just loved this woman. He just loved her. And uh, so this went on for a very, very long time. And now he writes back as he said he felt every person should actually 
get married or have a very deep relationship so they can really experience suffering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> really, he knows what he actually said to that. I never really experienced suffering until I had this, this relationship. So Jack Cornfield talks about all the teachers talk about coming out of there, they're just holding people and they get in a relationship, you know, and they realize they haven't the faintest idea how to work in that thing and that there are actually people who have different views and a different opinion about it. Everything. <laughs> so the idea is kind of coming about in my mind is is that there is a there really is quite a difference between doing your work on seeing into impermanent suffering and no suffering without moving your body, and then coming out into the world where you're working and dealing with things. It's a different set of rules that you have to operate from in the world with livelihood and speech and, and action than there is in the contemplative life where you're alone and going through your changes in, your, in the interior of your being. There, there's a shifting of gears. There's a, 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 a different kind of knowledge that you have to develop. And the missing ingredients in the Buddhist tradition is how to actually work efficiently with the emotional content, the shadow of your being, so that it will speed up your path to awakening. It's still in the process of being developed. It's still being worked on. And I think every Western teacher, after kind of ignoring this for a long period of time, finally has to come around to the fact that it's actually incredibly important to do that. And I believe that a good therapist, if you can find them and afford them, are probably quite happy. <laughs> and if not, then I really think that the dream, or and if you can, also the dream yoga, uh, this dream lucid dreaming, I think is, a, is, is really valuable. It's a, a really important consideration to doing that, that, uh, that work like that. I also have teaching dreams. I actually get, get teaching dreams. I'll tell you one of the dreams I had about the teaching dream that happened recently. It was very, very real, and I walked into this uh, Tibetan meditation uh, room where there was a, you know, all the paraphernalia there, the, the brocade, the Buddha's on the thing, the talk is in the background, and there is a, a platform up high. And there's one younger, like, monk, a high-ranking Tolku or Rinpoche, but young, 25. And then another ancient Tibetan monk in his robe sitting up there in a little bit higher throne. And I went in, I was, I was uh, in my best sit-down posture. I sat down next to them, moved my head a little bit forward like that. Internally, I was saying, oh, Jesus, not another one of these jerks. I'm going to have to sit here and listen to this crap for an hour or so. He's going to talk about philosophy and all that. He's going to get tired of listening to Buddhist monks talking to me about no self and the void and emptiness. You know, they don't have any idea what they're talking about. And there's so much more than they do. And as this is going through my mind, this older monk comes over puts his hands on my shoulder, and this immense bliss and quietness just poured right through my body, and he just held it there for a very extended period of time. It totally changed my view. <laughs> I've never, since that time, I've never had that thought ever arise about any teacher teaching anything again. It was totally not appropriate. But it was conditioned from interactions I had over years being a Theravada monk visiting tantric monasteries. You're like a second class citizen, you know. Great deal of respect, but they know you're just a baby. Okay, let's call that it for tonight. Thank you very much for your attention. Compassion, awareness, and wisdom. Oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby, oh, money, baby.